that's bad. So, I want to speak about science, not as a supporting role in business, not as a supporting role in entrepreneurship, but as the core engine of competitiveness. Because I believe actually countries like Bulgaria could be a source of such a competitiveness in the global market. So, first of all, let's talk about a little bit how the global market looks like. In 1874, it was very easy to start a company. You had a good idea, um, an interesting technology, a big local market, you register a company, and here you go, you're Alexander Bell, and you just set up the first telephone company in the world. Now today, you want to go again in telecommunications, and it's 2017, and this is what you see on the right. These are only 10% of the companies today that are working in mobile. 10%. I just didn't want to fit everybody because you could not read the titles. So how do you place yourself in this field? So globalization for me is nothing more than global competition. No, it's okay. um, so not only there are many of the companies, but the big ones in each category are absolutely huge. So we have in agriculture, ADM with 63 billion, Fi uh, Pfizer 53 billion, Nestle 231 billion, Apple 215. So how do you fight, how do you enter as an entrepreneur in a very populated space with such giants? Just want to give you a little idea what a billion really means. I don't know if you see a little ant here next to the skyscraper, just right here. So a little ant, here, the, it's, the height is three millimeters. The tallest building in New York, the world, One World Trade Center, is 546 meters. So the tallest building in New York is 182,000 times taller than the ant. Now, Apple, being 245 billion, and a startup with one million of revenue, so we're not talking about a small startup. One million is still one million dollars. You're making some good money. It's actually 215,000 times bigger. Actually bigger than the difference between the skyscraper and the ant. So how do you enter in this field and beat the skyscraper when you're an ant? So one way I have found as potential approach to the issue is to look at um, science-based cross-field innovations. These companies are so big and so successful because they're so specialized. They do not like to experiment with other industries so much. And even if they experiment, they do it only on the fringes. They don't go massively across industries. So in this strategy, putting people from different fields in one room and trying to solve a problem actually can result in innovation that the big companies are not able to replicate so fast. In this case, we put some biologists, a neuroscience, uh, a brain surgeon actually, and four different types of engineers to solve a simple problem. Get rid of the birds from airports. It's the birds are crashing into airports, uh, into planes on the airports, so somehow we had to take them out in a sustainable way. Right now at JFK, uh, they still use guns. Can you imagine flying airplanes and guns? So what we did is we put all these companies together and we formed a kind of a consortium company, which is called Volacom. Some of them were suppliers, some of them were partners, but all these people came together. Now, it was interesting, the biologists could not understand what the engineers were talking about in the beginning. Neither the engineers could talk uh, to the biologists at all. The biologists were asking about bird behavior. The engineers were talking about hertz and amps. And the brain surgeon was talking about reflexes in the brain. For about three months, they could not understand each other. But in the end, they started to talk to each other in the same language. And something was born that was never seen anywhere else in the world. G did not come up with it. Uh, the big uh, tech companies did not come up with it. It was a small Volacom in Krasnopolana that did it. So what, what was it all about? It turns out that the bird's brain uh, is working not too far, not too different from the human brain, sorry to tell. <laughs> and uh, when we applied the technology that was known in the human brain for testing depression, uh, which is called testing through acoustic startup reflex, you can apply it to birds. But in order to do that, we had to measure the hertz, the amps, 
the, the behavior of the bird and the uh, reflexes in the brain. All this stuff that none of the team players could do individually. So as I speak to you now, the sound goes to, uh, through your ears, through your um, cochlear nerve, goes to your hind brain, go, goes to the cortex of your brain, and you're hearing what I'm saying. Now, this happens though, and you, as you're doing this, your brain cuts the information in 10 milliseconds. It's almost like a computer using bits. If, however, in one bit, and one bit for a human brain is about 10 milliseconds. If, however, in 10 milliseconds you are able to rise the sound from zero to 112 decibels, something else happens. You close your eyes and you tighten your neck without understanding why. This is called acoustic startle reflex. And when you do it multiple times, you get more sensitive every time. You don't get used to it. After that, all the engineers taught how to direct the sound. And this is what was born. It was Volacom. I think it's the one of the best technology in the world currently for returning birds from airports. They're starting to install now in multiple airports. And I think we're going to hear a lot about them. Uh, including JFK had quite a lot of interest to, to put the system on their airports. So that was the first strategy, multi uh, cross-field innovation uh, with multidisciplinary teams. The second one that I found personally is actually using existing knowledge that's been used for many years in a new way. Usually in those industries they forget about innovation, they just do business as usual. And if you actually reshape some of the features of the existing products, you can come up with completely new innovation. This is a uh, Lactobacillus bulgaricus in blue. This is the yogurt bacteria of Bulgaria. We've been eating it for 4,000 years. Um, Bulgaria is one of the highest consumption per capita of yogurt in the world, yet we're not a leader in yogurt making at all. Uh, companies like uh, DuPont at 35 billion, like the non quite a few billion as well, Hansen. And Bulgaria, the, the original country of the Lactobacillus bulgaricus, have all very few little companies uh, with total sales less than maybe 35 million. Yet, what is it about yogurt? Uh, most of you probably don't know. Everybody in Bulgaria knows how to ferment a yogurt, taking a spoon from the previous yogurt, putting it in the hot milk, and the next morning you have a yogurt. But what if you don't have a spoon? And what if you don't have a yogurt? How do you make a yogurt? Turns out the traditional recipes of Bulgaria is actually putting different flours in the warm milk to ferment milk. If you go to the villages next to Sofia, they'll say uh, the queen's flowers. Another around Stara Zagora, they'll say snowdrop flowers. Around Primorsku, the bloom of an apple tree. You put the bloom of an apple tree into the milk, and the next day you have yogurt. Hmm. What's really happening? Uh, we analyzed this with quite a few scientists uh, in Sofia, and we saw that when you do this, you actually put a lot of bacteria in the warm milk. But the strongest bacteria in this local environment is the one that survives and makes the, the yogurt. So it's not a coincidence that we have Lactobacillus bulgaricus in all these villages across Bulgaria. It's just that this bacteria was the most competitive in milk at that temperature. So. Using this idea, we thought, oh wow, if this is so competitive, let's try to find the most competitive of the Lactobacilli, uh, specifically in Bulgaria, because there are about 2,000 strains, and let's apply this feature to something completely different than making yogurt. It's not very clear here to see, but when we chose the most competitive bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaricus GOB44 out of the 2,000, and it's easily measured, we can inhibit E. coli, which is a uh, uh, sickness causing bacteria within 24 hours. Using this feature, and now science, as, as that's the motto of my presentation, as the core of the search for competitiveness, we put a big science team. We had Sophie University, Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and ISU together. By the way, scientists like to work with each other. Uh, it's an easy coordination to do this if you have a good idea. Again, a bit of cross-field coordination between food, pharmacy, and agriculture, and few companies involved. So, since the bacteria growing on flowers originally, we thought, why, why should we uh, go to the usual yogurt and milk? Let's actually grow it on carrot juice. 
because with carrot juice, when you grow it, the final powder is allergen free. Lots of people cannot eat lactose. Uh, and it's completely uh, yeah, free of any allergens, free of any artificial elements. You can call it vegan. So there is all these consumer features that are not so popular with a yogurt strain. So we started testing it at Harvard, and we saw that it inhibits E. coli 015787, which is the deadliest E. coli, extremely well within 24 hours. Salmonella, extremely well. And Listeria. Now, this is for anybody who knows a bit more about biology in this room, would know that actually E. coli and Salmonella are gram negative and Listeria gram positive bacteria. It's very hard to have a single strain that inhibits all of them. Turns out our little Lactobacillus bulgaricus does. So it actually had some antifungal effects as well. And we decided to test if it inhibits all these pathogens, can it inhibit some of the well-known pathogens that causes diseases? So we started doing human trials in ISU now. We have over 100 patients to treat for H. pylori. H. pylori is the ulcer-causing bacteria. Uh, that about 60% of Bulgarians have it. And about worldwide, between, uh, depending on the country, 50 and 70%. Most of the people do have it. It's transferred through a kiss, so it's very easily transferred. And if your immune system goes down, you're starting to develop an ulcer. This is how ulcers get developed. So we are starting to test the inhibition properties of our yogurt strain bacteria that we're growing in carrot juice. And we saw that we have 91% success rate so far. So we have 74 patients. We're testing about 100 more now. Uh, and what does it mean? It means that antibiotic uh, uh, the, the disease that was, can be cured only with antibiotics right now can actually be cured before it even starts with a little Lactobacillus bulgaricus grown in carrot juice. If this confirms, that will be the first non-antibiotic treatment of this disease since it was discovered. And it's a, it covers a huge portion of the population. Uh, we were able to uh, recruit, after we had these findings, the Nobel Prize winner uh, for medicine of 2005, who actually discovered H. pylori, so he's now part of the team. And we're trying to make it a worldwide alternative uh, cure to that disease. We launched a product now, the Wall Street Journal, uh, wrote about us, which is kind of, uh, kind of cool because it's not so easy to, to get on the pages of Wall Street Journal. Opera became our client. Djokovic as well is taking it during the US Open. But the point is, when we step back, the core element here was we took something very traditional, known for 4,000 years. We used science as the main engine for competitiveness and we're able to break the world competitive markets in a way not to compete with all the cell phone companies, but in a completely innovative way. And I think this is one of the better chances for small companies without resources, if they want to go on the global stage, to be able to succeed. So this is the little model of science-based entrepreneurship. You have to have cross-field innovation teams, coordination between industries, global focus, and science as the main driver. Thank you very much.